Today, we are going to be telling you a really wild story out of Canada. This is a lesser known case, so a lot of you probably haven't heard of it, but it is a very crazy case. Many people could not believe how this all unfolded. The lengths that people will go to just get some satisfaction. It's a very interesting story. Today, we will be talking about the Pan family. This is Bic and Han Pan. Han was born in Vietnam and grew up there, but in 1979 he actually moved to Canada as a refugee. It was a very similar story with his wife, Bic Pan. She was also born in Vietnam and came over to Canada as a refugee. The two of them ended up getting together, got married in Toronto, and settled down in Scarborough, Canada. In 1986, they had their first daughter and named her Jennifer. In 1989, they had their second child and named him Felix. The Pans worked at an auto parts manufacturer called Magna International in Aurora, Ontario. Han worked as a tool and die maker, and Bic made car parts. This couple worked very hard for their money. They were immigrants who took every opportunity they could and worked as hard as possible. They wanted to make sure that their kids had opportunities that they never even had when they were younger. They were all about working hard. Both were very thrifty people and good savers. Eventually, they saved enough money to buy a really nice house. In 2004, they purchased their house and were super excited because this was something they had always wanted for their family. It was definitely their end goal, their dream was to afford a nice house for their family to grow up in. The house was in a residential area called Markham. They were also able to afford really nice cars. They were really living the dream, Bic was driving a Lexus, and Han was driving a Mercedes. They were doing really well. They felt like they had settled into a great neighborhood and were super excited about their future. Everything was going very well, up to that point for the Pan family. Now, probably the most important thing for you to know about this family is that they were very strict parents. They are what some people refer to as tiger parents. It's an Asian style of parenting that is very strict known to have very little leeway, and oftentimes the parents are extremely controlling of their kids. It can be a ton of pressure to grow up in a home with really strict parents who have extremely high expectations of you. That's exactly how the Pans were. They had hugely high expectations of their kids. They wanted them to excel, take every opportunity that they could get, and just do even better than they had done. Jennifer and Felix were thought to be very well-behaved kids. Felix was studying mechanical engineering at a very prestigious university, basically because Han wanted him to go to school for engineering so that he could work on cars and be part of what their family does. But he wanted him to be able to design the cars, which is a whole different ball game. Jennifer was also seen as a very impressive student. She had a lot going on in her extracurricular life. She started playing piano when she was only four years old. She also played the flute in the school band and did figure skating. She was actually super into figure skating and wanted to become an Olympic athlete, so she spent a ton of her time training, which is a very stressful world as well. However, she ended up tearing a ligament in her knee. It was a really bad injury, so bad that she ended up quitting figure skating altogether, and that dream was completely squashed. Jennifer was thought to be a very good student, but it turns out she was hiding a lot of things from her parents, and her school was actually one of them. Even though her parents put a ton of pressure on her to get good grades, she averaged around the C range and definitely wasn't getting straight A's. The only thing she was doing really well in was music. She really thrived in music and absolutely loved it, but her parents expected her to have straight A's. 
there was no choice for her. She ended up forging report cards, literally faking her grades, and convincing her parents that she was actually getting straight A's when she was a pretty average student. At the time, Jennifer was attending Mary Ward Catholic School. She ended up having to leave the school because her behavior and grades were so bad and transferred to a different school. Her parents knew that she moved schools and everything, and they were so strict. They picked her up every single day to watch her, basically like a hawk. They would get her in the car, take her straight home, monitor all her extracurricular activities, and make sure she wasn't just doing whatever as a teenager does. They had a serious issue when it came to boys. They were absolutely terrified of Jennifer getting distracted from her studies by boys, and they wouldn't let her even have friends that were boys. Really, they didn't want boys around their daughter, period. She was definitely not allowed to go on dates or anything like that. In fact, she wasn't even allowed to go to the school dances, you would feel so restricted, especially seeing everyone else live a somewhat normal life or have somewhat normal parents when it comes to how strict they are. I'm sure many of you out there have had or have really strict parents, and you know what it's like, and maybe you can relate to how Jennifer was feeling. She was really starting to feel trapped, like she was a prisoner in her own family. And not only that, but she was also faking tons of things in her life, literally forging stuff, and that's a lot of pressure to be keeping up a whole fake persona. Despite their best efforts to keep her from dating, she ended up meeting another boy named Daniel Wong in 11th grade. He was a year older than her in school and was described as goofy and really social. He played the trumpet in the school band. They connected on the fact they were both in the band. In 2003, they ended up going on a school field trip together, and it was a big field trip. It was all the way to Europe. When they were in Europe, they performed at this concert hall, and according to Jennifer, there was a ton of smoke in the concert hall from smokers. This really aggravated her asthma, and she was panicking over it, feeling like she was going to have a panic attack, like she couldn't breathe. Daniel was really there for her and really calmed her down, to help her, and she felt like he didn't have to do that, he didn't owe her anything. She said that it literally saved her life. So now she was really into Daniel. She felt like he saved her life, he really cared for her in that moment, and so she was head over heels into him. That summer, they started dating, and they were having a good summer together, although this had to be completely secret, behind her parents' back. Jennifer had actually received early admission into Ryerson University. However, Jennifer had failed one of her calculus classes back in high school in her senior year, so they ended up revoking her early admission. But Jennifer did not want her parents to know what was going on, so she hid this from them. She told everyone in her life that she was still going to the school, including her parents. This is when she created a fake acceptance letter and gave it to her parents. Jennifer must have been pretty good at faking stuff, probably had been doing it her whole life. It turns out that Jennifer never even graduated high school. She wasn't able to walk, she wasn't able to finish, and so she lied to her parents. Han wanted Jennifer to become a doctor but he figured out after a little while, getting to know his daughter more as a person, that you can't actually just make people what you want them to be. He figured out that it wasn't such a good route for her because it made her sick, it grossed her out to work on bodies and stuff. She didn't have the stomach for it. He decided that she still needed to be in the medical field though, to stay in what he originally wanted. He settled for pharmacology. He told Jennifer that she should become a pharmacologist, and she agreed. 
She told her parents that her plan was to attend Ryerson University, they were still under the impression that she graduated in everything, so she told them she was going to go there for two years and then transfer to the University of Toronto and get into their pharmacology program. Now, a lot of people would ask, how did the parents think that she was going to a college where they weren't paying any bills? Jennifer actually told them that she was going on all scholarship money and grants and everything, and that they didn't need to pay. She could take care of it all on her own, and her dad wasn't even involved in bills. To seem legit to her parents, she ended up purchasing textbooks, watching different documentaries, and taking real notes to show her parents, as if she were prepping for school. While she was in college, Jennifer was not allowed to do any of the normal things that teenagers or college students would do, like go to parties, hang out with friends, or drink. Jennifer never got to experience that. At the time, Jennifer was teaching piano lessons on the side and also working in a restaurant to make extra money and fund her life. Eventually, she went to the school, and two years went by with her parents thinking that she was at Ryerson University. After two years, her dad asked if she was planning to go to Toronto University to finish out her degree, and she said yes, that she was accepted, and that was the next plan. At this time, Jennifer suggested that maybe she should move out of her parents' house and in with a friend. She had a friend named Topes who lived a little closer to the University of Toronto. She thought that commuting back and forth downtown to her house would be a lot to handle and she convinced her parents that it was a good idea for her to move out and move in with someone else. They were fine with this. However, she wasn't staying with Topes. Imagine that, during the week when she was going to college, she was actually staying at her friend Daniel's house. She lied to Daniel's parents, said that her parents were fine with her staying there, and they were cool with it. She was perfectly set up, and her parents again thought she was staying with a female friend. Another two years went by with her parents believing that she was still in school. They now thought that she had been in school for four years, and it was about time for her to graduate from the University of Toronto. Daniel and she ended up finding someone online to help forge a fake transcript full of A's. Jennifer told her parents that they had an abnormally large class size at the University of Toronto, so they were only giving out one ticket per student for graduation. She didn't want to make either of her parents feel bad, so she told them that she ended up giving it to a friend. She told her parents that after she was done there, she was planning on volunteering at a blood testing lab called Sick Kids. Conveniently, she told her parents that she had to work late night shifts and during the weekend, so she convinced her parents that she should probably start spending most of her time at Tope's house. However, her parents noticed that she did not have a uniform or a key card for sick kids. One day, Jennifer's parents said that they wanted to bring her to the hospital and drop her off themselves to see what was going on. She gets in the car with them, they drive over to the hospital and she basically just gets out and books inside. Her parents went in after her, trying to see where she was working. They actually went in there looking for her, and she literally hid out for a long time in the emergency room, just hiding somewhere until she could leave, and her parents had cleared the area. With all this going on, her parents were starting to catch on. They felt like she was acting very strange and they were worried that they were being duped. The following day, they called Topes and asked her where Jennifer was. Topes said that she was not there. This is when they became very concerned. Later on, she came home, and they ended up really putting her on the spot, questioning her. Eventually, she confessed that she didn't actually work at sick kids and had made it all up. She also started to tell them that she did not go to the University of Toronto, that she instead was living with Daniel instead of Topes. She decided to keep them under the impression that she had graduated high school and gone to Ryerson University before the University of Toronto. 
At this point, she kind of halfway told them everything. Her mom and dad were very upset, to say the least. They really brought down the hammer on her. They took away her cell phone and her laptop. They wanted to cut off her connection with the outside world and also make her stop talking to Daniel completely. They literally made her quit her job at the restaurant. She was only allowed to teach piano, and they really put the clamp down on her. They started tracking her mileage in her car, literally adding it up to make sure that she wasn't going anywhere that she wasn't supposed to be. Jennifer was absolutely miserable. In February of 2009, she posted on her Facebook that living in her house was like being on house arrest. Even though she was only supposed to leave her house to go teach piano, she still would try to see Daniel every chance she could. One night, she even pulled the old-fashioned trick of putting blankets and pillows underneath her bed to make it look like she was sleeping there when she actually went over to Daniel's house. Of course, the next morning, her mom went into her room, pulled back the blankets, and saw that she wasn't there. They were really mad about that as well. They again tried to clamp down on her, wanting her to stop having any contact with Daniel. They also wanted her to start applying for colleges again and try to become a lab tech or something similar. Her dad gave her the ultimatum of going to school or being kicked out. He also told her there was no way for her to see Daniel at all, which was heartbreaking to her. She really loved this guy, teenage love, but for her, it was real love. Her dad said, no more seeing Daniel, which enraged her. He even said to her, if you want to see him, you're going to have to wait until I'm dead. Daniel, on the other hand, was actually getting really tired of Jennifer. He said that she came with a lot of drama, that he was sick of her making excuses for why they couldn't be together, and why she couldn't see him. He knew her parents were really strict, so he ended up deciding to end things, which was horrible for Jennifer. She went completely off the deep end. She was so upset because she felt like everything was out of her control, and her parents were causing her to lose someone she really cared about. It wasn't long before she found out that he ended up moving on pretty quickly and started dating a girl named Christine, which made her even angrier. She ended up being really jealous and devised a plan to tell Daniel that three men had randomly come into her house and attacked her. Then she said that a few days later, she received a bullet in the mail and told Daniel that this was his new girlfriend Christine trying to threaten her to stay away from her man. Jennifer was clearly going off the deep end here. In the spring of 2010, Jennifer ended up reconnecting with a guy she used to be friends with when she was younger, named Andrew. At one point, Andrew told her in confidence that he had considered possibly killing his father. Jennifer says that this sparked an idea for her. Life would be a lot better for her if her tiger parents weren't around if she didn't have her dad standing in the way of her relationship with Daniel or everything else she wanted. She wouldn't be forced to be anything she was not and getting rid of him started to seem pretty appealing to her. Andrew ended up introducing Jennifer to his friend named Ricardo Duncan. According to Jennifer, they ended up making a plan for him to kill her father in the parking lot of his work. She gave Duncan only $1,500 from her piano lesson money and told him to do it. However, Duncan ended up taking her money and not doing anything. $1,500 is really not a lot, and many people would do that for such a small amount. She eventually realized that she was being ripped off and gave up on Duncan. He claims that he told her no and that she gave him a couple of hundred bucks she already owed him for something else, but it had nothing to do with being paid to take out her father. Fast forward a little bit in time, and Jennifer kind of ends up back together with Daniel. They're talking again, dating again, and they end up coming up with a plan to take care of Jennifer's dad, because now this idea is stuck in her brain. 
This time, they wanted to take out both of her parents. They came up with this big, elaborate scheme to hire hitmen to come in and kill both of her parents. The plan was that she would get the money from their estate, which would be about half a million dollars, and the two of them would take that money and ride off into the sunset together. Daniel ended up giving Jennifer an iPhone to use as her burner phone for crime-related communication, and then she also had a Samsung that her parents paid for and that she did everything else on. Daniel connected Jennifer with an acquaintance of his named Leonard Crawford, who was nicknamed Homeboy. He said that he normally charged about $20,000 for this type of task, however, he was going to give them a friends and family discount, meaning it was only going to be $10,000 to take out her parents. Jennifer was like, sounds good to me. The three of them decided that November 8th was going to be the day that they did it. Linford said that his friend David was also going to help out. On November 8, 2010, that night was a pretty normal evening. Jennifer was watching TV in her bedroom. Han was reading the Vietnamese newspaper, and eventually, around 8.30 p.m., he went to bed. Bic was out dancing, she was into line dancing and was out doing that with a friend. She came home around 9.30, went upstairs to change into her pajamas, and went into the living room to watch TV. At 9.35, David called Jennifer. They spoke for a couple of minutes, and then the call ended. Around this time, Jennifer walked downstairs, said goodnight to her mom while she was watching TV, and then went to the front door and secretly unlocked it. At 10.02 p.m., the switch in the study went on and off, which was apparently a signal for the intruders to come into the house. A couple of minutes later, at 10.05, David and Jennifer were on the phone again for a few minutes. They also texted back and forth, one of them was Jennifer saying VIP access, which meant, you have access to my home now. There was also a third hitman who ended up joining in, and his name was Eric Cardi. Linford, David, and Eric all walked through the Pan family's front door. One of them ran upstairs to get Han, brought him down, and then Eric went upstairs to get Jennifer. She told police that she was just sitting in her room and heard footsteps from people she didn't know. According to Jennifer, he then made her go around the house and get any money that she had. She handed them 2,500 bucks, which she had made in piano lessons, and another 1,100 bucks that was hidden in her mother's nightstand. After this, Jennifer says they took her back upstairs and tied her to a banister. Apparently, they tied up her arm and also tied her hands behind her back, using a shoelace. At this time, Jennifer's parents were totally confused and begging the intruders not to hurt their daughter, Jennifer. They basically hinted to them that they wouldn't, saying she was going to be fine. They took her parents downstairs and shot them both. This is when Jennifer ended up calling 911. Jennifer, code is broken. So I'm broken and I heard shots like pop. I don't know what's happening. I'm tied upstairs. Did it sound like gunshots? I don't know what gunshots sound like. I just heard a pop. Shit. I'm okay. My dad just went outside screaming. Do you think your mom is downstairs too? I don't hear her anymore. Please hurry. I don't know what's happening. The call was frantic. Please help. I've been tied up. My parents have been shot. You can hear in the phone call that someone started screaming, and this was Han. He was not dead, he had come to, and realized that his wife was next to him and was screaming. He was able to crawl upstairs to the main floor of the house and was frantically screaming, you can hear it in the call. He ran out of the house, and this is where one of his neighbors saw him. The neighbor, who was about to leave for work, saw this man come screaming out of the house, covered in blood. The neighbor called 911 as well. The police and ambulance arrived, and they took Hans straight to the hospital, where he was put into an induced coma. 
No one knew exactly what was going on in the house except Jennifer. The York Regional Police interviewed Jennifer that night, and she told them that two men came into the house, started taking money from her, tied her to the banister, and then took her parents downstairs and shot them. In her interview with the police, Jennifer recounted. When you hear your mom come in, do you hear your mom in the house? She was in the house. I had gone down the stairs. Did you hear, so before this, this is when, when did you hear your mom for the first time in the house? When she came home. So did you physically see your mom? Yes. And at that time there was no one strange in the house? No, I went, she was on the downstairs sofa. She was watching TV when I last saw her. Between that time that you see her and you leave her on the sofa until you hear the noises, the strange, the, the, the voices as you describe them, how long is that? Maybe a half hour. A half an hour? Where is it your mom was before here? She goes dancing every Monday. She does goes dancing with a few relatives as well. What is the first, when you hear these, this, can you hear them talking downstairs, the unknown voices? A mumble. It's a mumble? Because I had the TV on, it was just all a mumble. When's the first time that you actually can hear one of them talking? When he was upstairs, and I thought he had left the upstairs, because I was frozen in my room for a while, yep. trying to listen in, but I couldn't hear over my TV, and I didn't want to startle, startle them by turning it off or like diminishing the volume. So I was kind of pressed up against my door for a while, trying to hear it. And I thought that all the people upstairs had gone down, so I opened up my door quietly and tried to peer out, and he saw me, and that's when he came. The only thing I can remember was him was he had dreadlocks. Did you see the gun? I only saw the top part of the gun. What did it look like? Um, kind of, it was black. Yeah. And it kind of not triangular but it was slightly wider at the end um, they sit me right at the bottom of the stairs like um, slightly out not exactly directly at the bottom of the stairwell but just slightly over a little the third guy who i didn't encounter but he was there he was like where's your money cooperate with us and you and then my mom's like you know yelling and don't hurt us and you know my money's in my wallet just please leave my paperwork this person this third guy who you're now describing do you see him ever only as a shadow? Because he was, there's a, a wall, a okay. partial wall, and he was like right in that vision over my father, but partially in that vision. And the next thing I can hear are them telling my parents to move to the basement. Okay. And I'm asking them, why, where are you going? And my mom's yelling to me, I want my daughter. Why can't my daughter come too? I want my daughter. Who goes down to the basement? Do you Can you see that from where you're sitting? My back is towards the wall. Do you hear anyone else in the main level where, where your parents were? Like you can hear, if people are trucking down the stairs, you hear your parents going down the stairs. Do you hear like five sets of footsteps, foot, footsteps going down there or can't you hear that? I was just such a distress. I, I don't exactly know how many people went down. Now. You might wonder how she was able to call 911 when she was tied up. Two days after the original interview, the police ended up bringing Jennifer back in because they were really questioning how she was able to so easily call 911 when she was tied up. Stand up and turn around. Put this in the side that you believe it was in. Great. Turn around. So that only you're looking away from me. You're looking exactly like now. Here is where the banister is. Put your hands back behind your back, exactly how you remember they were. Okay. Now, and the, are you restrained from movement? How far can you move your hands from the banister? They tied my upper arm. Yes. Around the banister. Yes. But my hands were bound together. So your hands bound together, and this is the arm that's the, the strings wrapped around against the banister. Mhm. Mm okay. So now, how can you get to the phone, and how do you make the phone call? 911. Mm -hmm. And do you talk down like that? Yes, I'm yelling at the phone like this. And how can you hear? I turned the volume on max. Yes. 
So that's exactly the way that you're talking to her against the railing. Mm -hmm. Dick's funeral was held on November 15, 2010, at the Ogden Chapel in Scarborough. During the funeral, the police actually had someone there specifically to spy on Jennifer and see how she was acting, to see if she seemed like someone who had just gone through this horrible invasion where two people came into her house, tied her up, and shot her parents. She should be absolutely devastated, but they noticed that during the funeral, she didn't show any emotion at all. Of course, everyone shows grief differently, that's something everyone knows, but you have to take it into consideration when someone isn't showing anything at all. It didn't take long before people around her started to feel like the whole thing was sketchy, including the police. Because of this, the police ended up surveilling her a lot of the time, having someone watching her secretly pretty much at all times. One thing that really wasn't adding up to the police at first was that this was supposedly a burglary. These people invaded the house and were asking for money, but the keys to their Lexus were sitting in plain view out on the counter. Why wouldn't someone take a car? There wasn't a single electronic device stolen, no jewelry, nothing like that. They even discovered that there was still money hidden in the house. They also thought it was strange that the intruders weren't carrying any type of crowbar. It seemed like they knew the front door was already going to be unlocked and just waiting for them. The thing that really wasn't adding up was, why would the intruders leave Jennifer completely unharmed? If they wanted to get rid of all the witnesses, they would have killed her too. Three days after this all happened, on November 12th, and actually woke up from his coma. He was in really bad shape, he had a broken bone close to his face, bruising on his face, bullet fragments actually stuck in his face, and a shattered neck bone. However, surprisingly, he remembered everything from that night. He said that while the men were in the house, he remembered Jennifer talking to one of them like they were friends. He saw them. He also said that her arms were not tied behind her back, that she was not tied to the banister, and that she was, in fact, walking around with these people around the house. This was hugely different from what Jennifer was telling the police. With this knowledge, they decided to bring her in for a third interview. This interrogation lasted a long time, nine hours. They were really at the point where they were starting to put blame on Jennifer to see how she would react and if they could get her to spill the truth. Eventually, she cracked and said she was lying to them, but she didn't tell them the complete truth. She said that she was depressed, that her life sucked, that she was basically on house arrest, and that she wanted someone to come in and kill her, but they got confused and got her parents instead. She said she had given up on her life didn't want to live anymore, and had just hired someone to do it all for her because it scared her. The police ended up, of course, arresting Jennifer right there on the spot. Eventually, they were able to figure out who the men were that were involved in the attack by looking through old phone records, text messages, and stuff like that. She had gotten rid of her SIM card, but there were some that were still on her iPhone they eventually arrested all of them. The trial began on March 19, 2014, and it lasted almost 10 months. There were more than 50 witnesses that testified. Jennifer was on the stand for seven days. Since there was already text message proof that she hired them to do this, her only defense was to pretend like she was hiring them for a different reason. She basically went in there and said she tried to cancel, and they wouldn't let her. The defense argued that she was going to have to pay regardless and that she would even have to pay them to not do the attack. However, this argument was weak and defeated in court pretty quickly because there were over a hundred messages that day between Jennifer, Daniel, and the other guys talking about what was going to happen to her parents that night. To the courts it didn't seem like she tried to cancel that hard. 
They also tried to argue that Jennifer had been through years and years of abuse from her really strict tiger parents and that she just couldn't take it any longer, that she had snapped and there was nothing she could do about it. All of them were convicted on December 13, 2014. Each of them received a life sentence without any possibility of parole for 25 years, so it's possible that they could end up staying in jail forever. We won't know until they apply for parole in 25 years, but they can't even do so until then, so they're going to be in there for a while. This included Jennifer, Daniel, David, and Linford. There was still Eric to deal with. He was still tried with them, but his lawyer was sick, so they ended up delaying his trial a little bit. In 2015, he ended up taking a plea deal. He only got 18 years because he decided to plead guilty. Jennifer's dad and her brother Felix ended up requesting a court-ordered protection where she could have no contact with them, and the judge honored this. She was not allowed to talk to either of them or have any contact with Daniel. Of course, this was incredibly hard on Jennifer's dad. He is said to be a shadow of what he once was. He is unable to work due to his injuries, he's depressed, he has nightmares and insomnia. People around him said he has not lived a normal life at all since. He has such severe anxiety that he can barely function anymore, which is pretty understandable. It would be so hard to find out that someone you thought you loved and trusted hired someone to take you out. You would probably never sleep okay again. He made one statement saying that he hopes his daughter can realize what she did and become a decent human. Felix ended up wanting to start his own life away from everyone, so he moved to the East Coast. Jennifer will be 49 before she's even considered for parole, but they highly doubt any of them will get parole. They're all currently being held in different correctional facilities. Eric ended up actually passing away in his cell in 2018. That's another whole thing, but basically, the fact that Jennifer's dad survived was what blew the top off of Jennifer's whole lie. There's a possibility they could have found out about it whether he survived or not, but in being able to say all that definitely made them take a second look at her and see that her story actually made no sense. It's a really crazy story. Just wanted to share this with you today. Please leave comments below on how you feel about this story. Until next time, be safe and take care of everyone around you. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be back next time of course to bring you yet another case but until then stay safe out there and please subscribe.